Good morning, good, good afternoon, buena tarde. Mr. Moji, Mr. Hatton, Mr. Moji, Enric Masip, members of the advisory group, members of the com conference committee, members of the panel discussion, architects, attendees, welcome to the headquarters of the College of Architects of Catalonia, the Catalan equivalent to the American Institute of Architects the House of the Architects and the Architecture here in Barcelona. We are especially pleased to host you, as it's the first time that we have the opportunity to set up bridges between the Committee on Architecture of, for Education of the American Institute of Architects and our association. So, let me take this chance to encourage you to consolidate this bridge by keeping the active and useful to both sides of the Atlantic. Finally, I want to show my gratitude to those who made this meeting possible, Enric Masip, Iñaki Aldai, Paul Hutton, and Bob Moji, among others. Uh, th uh, thank you very much for coming, and please enjoy, enjoy your stay in Barcelona, enjoy your stay in Catalonia, enjoy our Picassos. We have uh, found Picassos, prob probably, uh, this is the only one place in the world that you can touch Picasso's, <laughs> enjoy it, enjoy our building, our uh, institution, and our uh, staying here in Barcelona. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, hosting us. Uh Putting on an international conference is a little bit daunting. Uh, we had the good fortune of uh, enlisting the aid of and uh, his friends have been extremely generous and magnanimous. Um, I don't know how we could have done it without him and with all of your help. So um, for that, we are deeply in your debt. Uh, you have been nothing but gracious and helpful all the way along the way. So thank you for that. Um, this is kind of a unique occasion this evening where we're really interacting with some of the very best of the Catalonian architects. And uh, we just in the preliminary discussions, there was a lot of... Uh, interesting things that I think we can learn here. Uh, one is the culture and respect for design, which is one of our themes that we're trying to promote um, in uh, the CAE, but it's somehow uh, Catalonia seems to be way in front of us. It's the design and the care of design seems to be embedded in the DNA of this place, whereas in America we have to try and convince our clients that design is something they should notice, maybe even care about. And so I think there's an understanding here, uh, a deep cultural respect that we can learn a great deal from and hopefully be ambassadors back to our country of the centuries that have been built up around the design of the city and the culture that's been built that appreciates uh, what I think is very much in, a, in the front of our hearts and hopefully we can begin being ambassadors back to our country on that. Um, Hopefully, uh, you have enjoyed your time here so far. Um, just so you know what's coming up next uh, after this evening's discussions and the conclusion, tomorrow we go out and look at the region surrounding that and visit a number of schools and then back on the final day uh, to the center of Barcelona again. So we're approximately halfway through. We hope you're enjoying uh, the program that's been put together. Um, and. Uh, we're looking forward to the panel discussion tonight. I know that Claire and John have uh, prepared to entertain us on the American side. And Enrique has engaged uh, some of his good friends and very talented uh, Catalonian architects to talk about their work here. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Enrique. Thank you, Bob. Um, good evening. Thank you for coming and sharing with us this session today. I also like to thank COAG, the Catalan Architects Association, and its dean, Luis Comeron, for their interest and their good predisposition in hosting this event here today, and to the organizers and leaders of the group of, visi of visitors, their willingness to have such a session and in an otherwise very crowded program that you have. <laughs> um, the idea is to focus our attention 
in the relationship between innovation in typology, in architectural typology, and innovation in pedagogical um, issues, uh, and the way that uh, the space translates uh, pedagogical, specific pedagogical ideas. And to this purpose, we have thought that it would be interesting to share experiences, both American and Catalan, with you, uh, and to get a discussion started around, around those issues. Uh, we have invited five speakers that have had the uh, kindness not only to, to speak to us and share their experiences with us, but also to do it very shortly and very briefly and very intensely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, the time is tight and we want us to generate a dialogue, a common conversation afterwards. So, and we need uh, to be very, uh, very strict with timings. <coughs> we will start with uh, Carlos, Carlos Suero, pedagogue and director of the uh, Garbi School Pere Vergés one of the most innovative pedagogical institutions in Catalonia and one of the oldest as well. He is a very well-known um, polemist in pedagogical issues here and in America as well. So uh, I'm sure that his uh, view on these subjects will be of interest to all of us. We will continue then with Marce Barangué and Josep Ferrando, who will tell us about their experience as architects working for the um, public administration here in Catalonia, building uh, educational, um, educational spaces from uh, elementary schools down to university campuses. And then we will have uh, Claire Gallagher and John Dale who will uh, discuss entries from all over the USA from the AIA's uh, annual awards program. And that for us here in Catalonia and Europe, I would say in general, it's a very rare occasion to get to know these projects. We have very little information of what's going on in America. Um, so much for globalization. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I hope these contributions uh, will kick off comments and discussions and observations at the end. As I told you before, we want this to be more a conversation trying to enlarge the necessarily small time that we will have here explaining these experiences. And to get started, I would like to frame some of the issues of this panel. Uh, both conceptually and historically, a framing that will be in black and white. So I leave the colors for the contributors later on. And, and let me start with a confession. Um, I am a, a Montessori kid. <laughs> I was not only educated as, uh, in a Montessori school, but I, I, I was always aware of that, actually. Uh, we were all aware of that. It means that we shared, even being a kid, being kids, we shared an idea of how it should, how, what was going on. And this is something very important, to have an idea, a pedagogical idea. Then it, this idea needs to be translated into architecture. That's another story. Um, but getting more to the point, I think that, um, that the initial question uh, that we should ask uh, is, well, what is the space for education? What is the space of learning? What space is needed? Um, Montessori uh, would answer, what do you need for learning? You need love, you need... Uh, freedom and you need to play, uh, which is actually something that at that moment, and this is a picture from the beginning of the 20th century, uh, at that moment was not very common. So it was a revolution in itself. It was a revolution to, to speak for freedom as a tool for education. Um, this freedom Montessori, following Frebel's uh, ideas, 
um, for Montessori was not translated immediately into an architectural program. We all know that nowadays there is a big discussion about unschooling or homeschooling. I mean, there is a whole debate out there where in reality what is in question is should be schooling a social fact, a social act? Uh, should we need architecture for this social act? And this is a very crucial uh, question for me. I understand that all of us are here interested in architecture for the educational uh, experience, uh, the, uh, spaces for learning. I understand that we all share a, a common understanding that education has to be a social act. And in this sense, I think this discussion is beyond the point, but we have to address that at some point or another. Um, what is interesting to note is that, uh, anyway, all the renovation movements, all the educational renovation movements uh, since the 19th century uh, have been quite non-classroom-like, let's say. Uh, let's say that the classroom as a space has been put in, into question. It has been uh, exploded in many, in many cases. Uh, we will see later many examples of this explosion. Starting with Isadora Duncan's teaching, uh, dancing um, lessons in the, in the uh, au plein air. <clears throat> but not only uh, Frevel and Montessori developed uh, a system of learning that was not non-architectural, it was more uh, object-based, so to speak. Uh, it was more uh, oriented towards tools for learning than spaces for learning, although Montessori herself later on in, in, the, in the late tens and beginning of the twenties started this translation into architectural spaces that gave results in Europe very quickly. But um, not only they were, as I was saying, uh, non-architectural, let's say, uh, oriented, let's say non-room, non-classroom oriented, but at the same time the whole movement that generated a whole influence, a very deep influence into how we think architecture for the education nowadays has started, which is the, the um, open air uh, school. Uh, this is a, an example from the, it started in Germany at the end of 19th century actually, but very early in, in, uh, in the rest of Europe it spread all around. And it is basically an, uh, um, an idea, an edu pedagogical idea that opens up the classroom and it's f interesting to note that actually all these examples come from the nor from north of Europe, from a colder Europe, let's say. Uh, Germany, uh, Scandinavia, England, etc. Um, soon, so some of the most advanced uh, school um, buildings since the beginning of the 20th century started adopting this non-classroom centered uh, focus. And as they generated uh, more uh, ambiguous spaces in which students were more on control of what was going on in, the sp in those spaces. Uh, let's say they started opening the classroom because they thought that the classroom had a hierarchical uh, orientation that was not uh, proper for the good learning of the students. Um, so, this, the generation of student control spaces are still, we are working still around these ideas. We are the most advanced uh, projects that we can find nowadays are still around spaces that are non-classroom, that are non-hierarchical, that are non, uh, that are open for different uses, that can be appropriated by students or professors alike, etc. So this is 
let's say, our common ground. This is our tradition. This is where we start from. This is actually where we should start being conscious that we are building on top of that. And for that we have a long tradition of very good examples all over, all over the world, from Europe to Japan, of course in America. Starting with these uh, examples of the open air movement <coughs> in both uh, Holland or France, the open air school movement, which as you can see, it's all based around oops, sorry. Does it? Okay. It's about opening the limits of the classroom of actually um, not so much uh, bringing the outside in, but moving from the inside out. Or this uh, Montessori school in Amsterdam, which is still working nowadays exactly in the same fashion as it was designed in 1934. Or the Terrani famous uh, elementary school in, in Como which is also based in huge spaces outside with very big spaces that can be configured differently inside with a, actually a, a whole core uh, which is ambiguous in function and that can be used in many different ways. Or Richard Neutra in the United States with this excellent example at, in California. This is a a beautiful drawing by Richard Nautra that explains exactly what I was saying, right? I mean, how the school is going out, and actually this is a circle that somehow comes with <laughs> the roundness of the tree, and we are back to that Benares slide teach people, uh, pupils learning under the tree, which is, it seems that this is, it, it could be understood as an anti-architectonic uh, ideal, but it's not. It's actually very architectonic, and it is something that we should build on. And down to the 50s and 70s with this poor building that was destroyed a couple of years ago and substituted by a very conservative uh, layout in terms of pedagogical um, layout or Hetzberger in Holland again, where these open courts, where everything is possible, the steps that are so, so much used uh, in different moments, in different ways. Here in Catalonia, we are no different. We were not different, at least at the beginning. At the, at the end of 19th century, there was this institution called Associació Protectora de l'Ensenyança Catalana, that was founded in 18, 1895 or 6, I think. It's actually one of the oldest institutions for the renovation of pedagogical uh, uh, in Europe, for, for pedagogy in Europe. Of course, it had many uh, ups and downs. You know, the history of Spain, in which Catalonia still belongs, is, has been very bumpy, especially in the 20th century. and. <clears throat> It didn't help. It, it helped a lot that at 1914, uh, the first modern Catalan government was uh, established. And they started the program of uh, literacy. Literacy at that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, was about 40% in Catalonia. And they managed in 15 years to bring it down to 20%, doubling the population which is an amazing fact, if you come to think about it. This is one of the first uh, buildings they did uh, in, here in Barcelona, in Barceloneta, by the beach, a very open uh, example of uh, how it should be, actually inspired and directed by Pere Vergés, uh, one of the leaders of the renovation of pedagogy here in Catalonia. Another, uh, Relevant example by the same architect, Josep Goudai, is this one you can see in Barcelona, still functioning, still as it was built in 31. 
and you can see here how it's basically there are basically two huge three huge classrooms and the rest is an undefined space which is a great example of this uh, non-hierarchical learning spaces or more in, in more modern times uh, in the 60s the Scola Garbi by Martorell, Boigas and McKay that I, I'm not sure that you we were th thinking about visiting it's still functioning, it's still functioning more or less the same uh, fashion as it was uh, designed uh, 70 years ago. But, uh, sorry, uh, 50 years ago. But uh, the end, I think we dropped that, that one. It's, it's a bit, f it's not in Barcelona, it's a bit far south, uh, but the, within the metropolitan area. It, it is also based into a central core which is undefined in fashion and it can work as a um, dining room or it can be a learning room, it can be used in many different ways. And students are working outside the classroom as well as inside. And in session here you have this, this space that we can. Or by the same architects, the Scola Tau, which is a beautiful example of uh, how to adapt to a very difficult site, how to profit actually from these difficulties, to turning difficulties into opportunities. And, sorry, oop. and again, the same scheme of openness and undefinedness at the core of the building. Well, the buildings you will see tomorrow are probably not of this sort. They are buildings uh, promoted by the public administration and we have to say that the second time that the Catalan government was established in the 20th century, that was in 87, 1987 with the new Spanish democracy, uh, the, the Catalan government was very aware that doing a pol uh, an educational policy meant especially uh, doing new buildings for this policy. And I would say that at that moment those were very innovative in certain aspects. Uh, the buildings designed by the Catalan government from the 80s down to the mid 90s were very, some of them were very innovative and many were very good in terms of architectural qualities. Uh, which is, I think, a very important statement for, a, for an administration, for a public administration to make. Say, here we are, this is le the level we want to set, and this is the horizon we are drawing for our future. The thing is that from the 90s down to nowadays, all these ideas have been somehow frozen, and there hasn't been uh, a dynamism to change or to revise or to reconsider those, uh, those concepts. And I think that we are now in the moment that this has to be addressed here in Catalonia. And we hope that from the discussion we're going to have today, some of these aspects we'll learn and we will be able to put forward uh, for our future. Thank you. So I introduce you, Carles Suero, director of Escola Garbí, Fundació Pere Vergés.
Okay. Um, thanks for the presentation and the invitation, and Rick. I have to say uh, I, I consider myself very lucky because I've, I have worked in two of the schools you have shown here. One is the school I'm working right now, which is Pere Vergés. It's called Pere Vergés, and the other school is Tau, uh, the, 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 the last picture you, you showed here. And I worked, that, in fact, that was my first school when I was 25 from 33. Uh, and I'd say this space you've shown here, it's something uh, that's been really used right now in, in that school. So let me introduce myself. My name is Carlos Suero. I am the, the principal of a 1,000 student school in the north of Barcelona. And my school was founded by this guy here um, that appears in, in the iPad. Uh, he also founded a school uh, at the start of the 20th century called Scola del Mar. Uh, Enric has shown you that school. Uh, seaside the school, uh, it's a difficult translation. Uh, that school uh, was a miracle like that. Okay? Um, you can find a lot of literature about that school. Um, I would say that its approach was more innovative and modern than most of the schools uh, we have today. There is even a, a, a PhD written, and the model, uh, the pedagogical model, is, is being studied in a lot of teachers' schools here in Catalonia and, and even in, in Spain. Um, for instance, the kids were allowed to swim here in the water, and they only had the help of an amateur life work. Uh, on a small boat that was called Nausicaa. We have a classroom in my school which is called Nausicaa, so he was on the, the, the boat uh, just uh, looking for, for the kids. So the, 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 the freedom atmosphere was, was absolute. That's uh, another picture of, of the school, okay? Uh, there's, uh, as, as Enrique has told you, um, it's, for me it's, it, it should be compulsory to have an idea uh, beside every school. Uh, every director or every principal of a school uh, should be capable of explaining the idea of his school in two minutes, okay? And this is not happening in a lot of schools today. The idea of that school was simple, was to simulate the organization of a city. That's it. And make all students participate in, in this organization. So, so the students in that school uh, were supposed to be uh, citizens in an uh, imagina im imaginative city. Okay. That's another picture. Uh, of course, the idea of community relied on the deeper sense of the school, and the participation was one of the most important levers for learning. Uh, so so um, uh, the participation uh, in that school, in our school, is not anecdotic. It's something which is considered crucial for learning. Uh, this is an amazing lever. This is an image of our school today. I mean, uh, Escola del Mar was bombed uh, by, by, by bombs in the Civil War, which was more or less 70 years ago, and it was destroyed. Uh, today, in, in my room, in my desk, I have uh, a good, uh, which is, uh, I think I, I've shown you that you, you were there. Uh, it, it's the only thing that, that, that uh, stays of, of that school, okay? So today we have two schools, uh, this one of, of them, an old Indiano building uh, surrounded by, by nature. And we still preserve uh, some main basic ideas. Uh, ideas uh, which completely lay on the foundation of psychology, uh, psychopsychology, sociology, or, or whatever. Uh, today there's a difference, a big difference between uh, 100 years ago. Uh, we have a lot of evidence about how kids learn. Uh, old pedagogues didn't. So they worked more or less under intuition. One of those ideas, those ideas is that kids should go to school to work, not to listen. This is absolutely important. Our role as a teacher is to design significant activities to cause learning. That's it. That's it. Uh, our role is not to keep on talking six hours a day. So they need to go there to learn, okay, to work. Another fundamental idea, I'm going just to say three ideas, very basic, uh, is that they have to participate in school day to day. Okay? Uh, they have to be active players in school management. Uh, in this case, in our school, these are uh, democratic elections to choose the representatives of the kids. And of course, there's a lot of uh, liturgy and work and there's under these, these elections. Okay? 
And the third idea, just three, is that the, the 15 years uh, a kid here in Catalonia spends 15 years in school, from three years old to 18. So that 15 years uh, are not only a, a name for something. Uh, those 15 years have a finality for themselves. Uh, and comfort and well-being are, are crucial to create like an I feel like at home atmosphere. Okay? They, they, they need to feel like at home at, at, at school. This is really important. Let's change the focus on the presentation. Let me introduce uh, yourself, um, an imaginary student. His name is Juan, uh, and he's not going to an innovative school. He's going to a standard school. During summer, he looks happy. He's handsome. He explains things. Explains things. He has friends. He's autonomous, and he looks fully competent for life. In winter, school happens. He gets sad. He's nervous all the time. He doesn't explain anything. He's irritable. Uh, he hates homework and. He doesn't get good grades at school. I am sure all of you have one Juan in your life. Uh, they are forcing him to play a game he cannot win. And I have to add one relevant detail. He likes learning things. In fact, he learns. He's fully open to his interests. On the other hand, we have another imaginary student called Magali. She's also happier in summer than in winter. More or less, she's succeeding at school. Her strategy to do it is to follow two basic rules. Be quiet, the first one, and do what they tell you to do. If you do these two basic things, you will succeed in school, for sure. She's learning things. She gets bored at class, and she, all, she also hates homework. But she gets it always done, and her parents aren't, are not sure that her success at school will imply any success, success in real life. So there's a, a real uh, controversy here. I mean, if school uh, prepares for real life, there should be a relation between success at school and success at real life. Magali and Joan are going to an standard school, similar to, I'd say, 80, 90 percent of the schools uh, here in Catalonia. Although they, there were amazing innovative schools on 100 years ago, as we have shown, uh, there has been a poor transference to the majority of schools today. Uh, even if we assume that there is few innovation models, that innovation can come from really different vectors. In one school we can innovate just through methodology, okay? which is just the, the way and the type of activities uh, we design. Of course, we can innovate through technology. In the picture, they are playing chess. Okay, that's just a joke. But the picture is framed on an iPad. Uh, in, in our school, we have started a big iPad deployment, so that's the, the reason of, of, this, of this picture. Okay? We can innovate through social interaction. That's really a uh, really innovative vector in, in some schools, and it's really difficult to, to roll out something like that. Uh, just working on the relationship between kids of different ages. And we can innovate through scheduling and organization. Um, those kids are looking at their timetable. And for instance, there are some schools uh, in Barcelona that change the timetable each week. Okay? It's a way of, of, of learning. Of course, we can innovate through architecture. There's no picture here. Um, I could not dare to show a new an innovative picture related to school architecture when I'm surrounded by architects. I, I, okay? so I'm, I'm really sorry. That's, that's, that's your job. As I said, the degree of school innovation is low compared to other sectors, and the degree of school innovation related to architecture is poor. Uh, the corridor class model is still a reality. I would say it's a, a, a majority reality. And in my opinion and experience, uh, the management of space and volume is one of the most important levers for learning. The corridor class model is not valid when we prioritize participation, autonomous work, or the student's well-being. The corridor class model is a model that emphasizes the control of the students. That's really clear. Uh, that doesn't create a free atmosphere 
fundamental to educating responsibility. We cannot educate in responsibility without freedom and contributes to transform schools in a hostile environment for our kids. Joan's and Magali problem is that every day they have to go to a hostile environment where there's a siren that sounds at half eight, someone with a kiss that opens that, that, the door and 500 students get in the classroom and that's it. They have one class, one another, another, another and, and that's it. There's no inter interaction, no participation and whatever. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the message. Uh, I'd say uh, we need to have an idea uh, for our school and we need to transform the idea in spaces and volumes. Yesterday, just to, to prepare or to find some ideas for, for that little speech, I was looking to TED Talks. Uh, and I assume you, you, know, you know that web page, okay? Uh, I, I looked for uh, architecture TED Talks and there were, I, I found 90, more or less. Uh, any of those 90 talks was related to architectures and schools there. There was nothing. There was nothing. Okay? So, uh, just that's a uh, factor, something that I think uh, we, we have uh, really uh, room to improve in, in, this, in this space. Uh, I hope uh, I, I tell you a clear message and I hope we will uh, participate and, and answer some questions. Uh, after that. Thank you. Marce Berenguer, principal of uh, Roldan Berenguer Architects. They have worked a lot on uh, elementary, primary, and secondary uh, schools. See? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, talk uh, architecture after drink wine. I think it's better for. Uh, uh, understand uh, a little these four schools, these primary schools that I want uh, to show today here. Okay, if you want. Next. Uh, I, uh, these are four schools. Uh, I want to show uh, how uh, the school offer uh, to the, uh, the small towns uh, more than one school. What, uh, and I tried to show you here how uh, things uh, these public uh, schools can offer also for, for the town. Next. This is uh, all are in Catalonia, these schools, all are public. And uh, uh, we are, uh, we are, I don't show the classrooms, I show the different parts uh, from these schools that I want to send a message from you. This is Katja. Uh, this is the school. It's in the top of the hill, in, in a, one small hill, uh, next to the other old hill uh, with the there are an old castle. Okay, next. This is the drawing from the competition. This is the first floor of the school. It's open to the south. Next picture. This is the view from the old castle. Our school, it's far, okay, it's in this point, in the other hill, next one. This is outside, the outside of the school, it's close, it's this white wall, no, next. Here, uh, the entrance of the school, it's a small mountain, next. Here, it's one of the most important part for the projects is the uh, for our uh, school projects it's the porch uh, the porch it's the area uh, it's the heart of the school for us because it's the the place on all the things happen it's the the, the door of the school it's the center of the school it's the place with the relation with the interior 
and with the stereo, with the uh, uh, play uh, path, the, the sportive area. And it's the area when they have activities outside but cover. No? Next. In, in this courtyard, we have uh, the corridors around of this courtyard. It's like a cloister because we have the south orientation for the corridors and north, north orientation for the classrooms. And the fence of this uh, school, it's also a bench. It's uh, always in architectural. The things are not only one thing, are more than one. No? Next. This, it's, this diagram simplify our idea in this school. Uh, we call era solar. I don't know. Uh, this is one question for you. Uh, I don't know the translation from ERA. ERA is a very Catalan name. Do you know? ERA? Yes. It's the place when the agriculture works. Works, they recollect all the, the... And it's in the top, in the hills. It's in the hills. And uh, when we arrive here, we have one era. And uh, we want that uh, the, 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 the era remains also in a, with the, the school, no? And always the era is very well orientated to the south. And I show you here, this is the corridor, this is the entrance, the porch, and it's in relation with the sportive open area and the cover. Uh, hall area, no, here. Okay, next one. This is the, the courier. We have a fantastic view to the land in the same way than it was when we arrived before the, the school. Next. It's a gray day, but normally it's a sunny day, like uh, today, no, for, uh, okay, here it's with the scale of the, the plants. Next. And this is the uh, 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 sportive hall. Uh, this, this building also remain the uh, all uh, uh, farmer uh, places. No, it's uh, it's made like with a compressed straw because this building is storage straw before, and we and we built the interior with this material for have the same color, the same feeling uh, than the all storage straw. Next one. Other idea than we work here is the impluvium. The courtyard and the roof of the schools, they captured the water and uh, we storage this for, uh, to apply the, the landscape next to the, the building. Next. We can see when it's raining, no? this water we use. Next one. Uh, I say, I don't tell the interior of the classroom, we put the, the outside, the, uh, it's a fun how the kids can be teachers in the free time, no? they are the teacher in the blackboard and uh, they make the classes, but in the free time, not, uh, okay, next time, next. Uh, this uh, second school, PAX, we call it PAX. It's also uh, the second example that we work with the landscape. In the first, it's the era, the idea, not for the all uh, agriculture uh, uh, works. And uh, in this case, is related with a pine uh, mountain that we have in this project. This, uh, these uh, two examples are in, uh, the, in the limits of the town. It's not in the center, it's in the limit. It's for that that we take profit for the landscape more than from the structure, the urban structure. Okay, here also we have an uh, all uh, village uh, at the top, uh, an all uh, modernist how village. It's for that that we develop the project uh, down next to the street in the right corner and we, uh, we leave uh, free the mountain and uh, this old house. Next. This is an automatic next. This is the entrance. Again, it's the porch. 
no, related the exterior and the interior. Next. And here we are under the porch. Uh, and we see how it's the, like a frame, no? then we can see the modernist house and how we work uh, the school in the right hand, right hand and we made the, a ramp and a, an entrance for the pine mountain that we have here. Next. This is the, in the other direction, the, the view, the, the sportive uh, uh, path here, the porch and uh, the two parts of the school and our mountain. Next. This is the studies of the topography. We design how all the kids can use this ram, how, uh, like one part of this uh, pine uh, mountain. This is a view from the, the forest to the, the classrooms. Next. And this is the view inside to the classrooms. We have always the north orientation for the classrooms and here it's really painful to, to study because you have this fantastic uh, forest that we preserve. No? Next. Now the next two examples are also in the small towns but in the center of the town. That means then the projects offered to the city after the schedule uh, of the, uh, the school, they offer the, the open spaces like a piazza uh, for the, the town, no? because they are in, inside of the urban context. No? Next. All this drawing, are, I know that it's impossible you understand, but I show you because I think maybe you can imagine things. And it's, uh, <laughs> This is the first uh, school that uh, is, it was there when we arrived, it's LP, no? This is school. And also they have this one prefabricated pavilion. Our intervention was to make the double pavilion, second pavilion, and two corridors. In the middle is the path, uh, the sportive path. Okay. This is the ground floor and first floor. Yellow means it's hall, it's the vestibule of this school, it's the corridors, and gray, it's the classrooms, and uh, in the first floor, the gym. Next one. This is the outside view. Always in our schools in the city, they are protected from the exterior, but this point, then it's the heart. No? I told you, it's where we, I, we are located, the porch and the entrance, this is the axis of the school and it's the place that then we related with the city. Next one. We preserve the old uh, walls in this school. This is the shadow from the farola. Do you know farola? In, 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 it's in Spanish. Lamp. Lamp. <laughs> okay. This is uh, one of the drawings that uh, we approach to the entrance to the porch. And this is the brick wall that it's putting in front of the original pavilion, then it's concrete, it's like a brick curtain, no? then they protect it for the security and the sun. Next one. This is the entrance. No? Then uh, here, when we enter, we have the port. These are the lamb from the sportive path. Next. This is the, the sportive path that many times they use like a piazza uh, uh, after uh, the um, schedule from the, in, the, in the weekends. No? This is the, the ram uh, that leads to, to the gym. This is the porch and we have below, next. The vestibule, next. And if you can, these are all the corridors and uh, then it, it are connected with the interior courtyards. Next one. This is the, here we have classrooms, then they have the connection with the exterior courtyard and they can make the, uh, the classroom outside, no? Mm -hmm. Next one. 
this is very special. This is this project is in process. It's in, in construction now, and then uh, it's probably less clear to understand. But you can have uh, some uh, image. This is a very nice city. Then in Catalonia, it's big, and uh, this old city. You can see uh, the shape of the old city and uh, with a fantastic, the, one of the best uh, piazzas that we have in Catalonia are there. And uh, this city is plenty of cloisters and church, and one of them is Trinitaris. Trinitaris is an old Baroque church, very uh, simple, not interesting, and we have all this parcel for to renovate this church and also for to make a new uh, school, a new public school. We organize this school with uh, many different entrants because it's the way that they work in the old city. You know? They are different parts for the king gardens, for uh, a different when they, they, they are older. And then we divide the school in different entrants and with different courtyards than they remain to the cloisters. Next one. This is one axonometric from the, the new school. This is the church, and this is one of the entrance, no? the, the path, the Olympic, the sportive path, the kindergarten playground. Next one. Uh, this is something that I love. It's the, it's the way that we think. No? It's the how the church then it's also in this uh, um, in this school complex how this church we transform more in uh, one interior square we are next to a very narrow street Carre San Pere and you can see for next picture we transform this church we uh, we take out the brick the the wall that we have here and we put a glass uh, door and uh, when this church then it's a polyvalent uh, hall it's a place that they make uh, concerts or uh, conference uh, many things very different things they open these uh, doors the wood doors and then appear in this narrow street appear this big uh, space no this uh, it's something it's r a really uh, atonish no than uh, when in a very narrow street okay next one we transform uh, this is a very poor uh, church we transform and we paint the the ceiling in uh, white uh, it's a, uh, because it's really dark this we don't have windows in this church and then we transform the ceiling of this church in a lamp. No? All this church is making by arch. Next one. Next one. And next one. This is the plan, some drawings from the school. And uh, here we show how uh, uh, now the, all the, the exterior courtyards, it's not in the drawing. But here we show the porch and the uh, gym hall and uh, other ports, these parts works in the same way like the bat cover, in the same way like the small courtyards that we have in this school. Next one. This is a little like a dosonometric, the plant, next one. This is only the, king, the kindergarten part and uh, it's in construction now. Uh, you can see how the porch we use here a very thinner uh, uh, steel uh, plate and uh, we use the corp for uh, to to work better like a structure and of course for to be related with the church with the arts of the church no? here this wall it's a prefabricate uh, uh, wall with concrete and we use the stones from the area and uh, we prefabricate with the, then we have the colors of the site that is the, uh, used by the, the, this fence 
all over in this school. Hmm? Next one. This is the interior, it's not finished. No? Here we have, also we work with the circles. This is a huge spot, then they have to be trees or to have shadows in this school. Next one. The circles at, are also to show the entrance in its classroom. This is the interior. Next one. Here you can see the, in this part we have the corridor and here is the, the relation with the uh, playground. Uh, glass and glass. It's because we want to extend the class in the corridor. And uh, next one. Okay, the relation with the next one. And here they use uh, this glass uh, wall. It's like a furniture, and they use for to add things uh, in uh, in the school. I think it's the last. Okay, it's in one quarter. <laughs> Ah, okay, because he said too much is likes. Thank you. waiting to, 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 to turn off the lights, the, at least the, the first one, so I think, is it possible or not? More? It doesn't matter, okay. <laughs> is it in order that you want, you want to sleep after the wine, as you know, okay? <laughs> it was, uh, so. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much for being here, it's a pleasure for me to be here to, to show you this, um, this project. Uh, that we were doing together, my office and the office of uh, Pere Joan Rabellat and Carmo Rivas. Uh, in fact, this is a, a university campus. You will see that this is only uh, a building, only one building, a single building. But for uh, this competition that was um, in the 2006, they opened the competition saying that this is the new campus for the University Rovira i Virgili. The University Rovira i Virgili uh, began in the 1991st and it was invented, invented by the Catalan Parliament in order to join different universities that were open in the area of uh, South Catalonia, in the area of Tarragona. They wanted to open a new university, or they wanted to recuperate all the uh, strong universities from the south of uh, uh, Catalonia. And they decided to join, as I told you, this, all these uh, uh, small universities in a new one called Rovira i Virgili. After 15 years, uh, the Rovira Virgili organized a competition to, uh, to build a new campus in the area called Terras de Lebra. That means the Lebra, uh, Ebro River uh, landscape or lands. So this is a, a place in the city of Tortosa. Tortosa is a city, uh, is a city uh, two hours and a half more west by car from Barcelona uh, to the south. Uh, and this is just next to the, to the River Ebro. So this is, a, as I told you, it's a, it's a, it's a, theoretically it's a campus because there are, there are four kinds of studies, business, nursing, uh, education, teaching, and um, communication science. Um, for me, what I will try to explain to you about our building is how the building, how the architecture is related to the, to the outside landscape and to the inside landscape. Understood the outside landscape like the space for the public 
and the inside landscape, the space for the collectivity, for the students. And for me, this is a, an important image that show that, that show this level, which is one meter. One meter is the, the level zero of the project. And this is a very important thing. So the project is not London, landing in the, in, the, in the plot. It's a little bit upper of this plot. In order to be collect, connected with, with the different parts of the urban landscape and the natural landscape. First thing, the one meter is the difference of level between the park and the street level. Second is that when you are one meter above, you're visually connected to the river, river Ebro. If not, you will be hidden, hidden because, the, because the wall. The second is that this is the maximum level that the river can grow up. So obviously, we have to avoid the, to have the water inside. This is the same level that we have in the Congress Center that is closed. So finally, this is the, the level zero that explains the, the, the wall of the land, which is this uh, huge uh, um, concrete slab, which is the foundation. There are not more foundation. This, this is like a big towel of one meter of thickness, where we have all these 10,000 square meters of building above. So this is the wall of the, of the cave, no? and this is the wall of the, of the nest. So this is the wall of the, of the land, and this is the wall of the trees. This is con in sit concrete in situ, and this is concrete prefab. So this was the first operation. No? To be related to the landscape, to the closed landscape, is to generate this kind of a big concrete towel that connects with the street, that is a little bit arise from the land in order to be con visually connected to the river, and in order to understand that the building is not belonging to this part of the park, that the, instead of that, no, rather than that, the building is connected with all the park surrounding the, this space. So above this towel, we have this, uh, the building uh, trying to avoid to have this kind of a back, uh, back facade or front facade. The building is trying to be connected with all the facades and trying to to show that it's trying to deal with all the city, with all the views and all the surroundings. So it's trying to, under, to be understood as something that is like a twisting, turning. But obviously, with, always with natural light, that is trying to segment and to, trying to organize the inner spaces. And with a continuous facade that explains with a lattice how the building is always uh, trying to recognize the surrounding views. So this is the building here that is in a continuous uh, asymmetric dialogue with the Congress Center. The Congress Center is rectangular. This one is fragmented. This one is a glass, uh, U-glass construction. This is concrete. So this is translucent. This is opaque. One is uh, heavy. The other one is light, etc. So but at the same time, the, as you can see here, the building tries to be like a, like a door because it's in the, limit of the, in the limit between the city and the agricultural landscape. It's in between the river and the avenue, between the park and the Congress Hall. So the building tries to be a door for the, for the citizens. They're not trying to be something that you don't cross. We are trying that the people that is walking in the riverside pathway is crossing in this way, because there is a small bridge here uh, above this channel, you could cross here and you could go to the to the Congress Hall. So finally, it's trying to be recognized as a door instead of as a building. And at the same time, as you can see, we were avoiding from the competition to have four four buildings for four different studies. From the beginning, we decided that the campus should be only one building in order to have more mass to dialogue with existing buildings to have the scale of the park and to be understood as a door. This is the Ebro uh, Delta, and this is the Tortosa city, and this is the situation. No? So we're close to the, to the mountains that we saw here, which are the Port of Estates mountains, the river, as I told you, and next to the Congress Hall. So the first operation was done, not to above, to rise, to modify a little bit the landscape in order to, to make it uh, comfortable for the building. And you, as you can see, you can cross in this longitudinal direction, in the, in the direction the city river, or in this transversal direction, 
between park and congress center. So this building is trying to embrace some parts of the park. So it's trying to recognize some like open rooms, you know, open classrooms uh, related to the park, but in a different level. No? In order that you are not exactly in the park, you are in a, some part of the park, but controlled by the architecture of the building. So this one facade is more fragmented, related to the, to the park scale and the river. And the, this facade is less fragmented, a little bit flat, more vertical, in relation to the city and the Congress Hall. And in fact, this facade is related to the, to the existing facade of, the, of Tortosa, as we can see in these uh, old cartog military cartographies, where we can recognize that the city, or the facade of this city, is always like a mass piece with a very small perforations, with the texture of this construction. And all the, all the city and the suit is an only one building where you can find different, different plans. So the building is trying to, rec to be recognized from the river view in the same way. So with this kind of fragmentation, organized with only two prefab uh, modules of concrete. This is a public building, so we see it's built, uh, the construction of this building is built by, uh, the budget is 90, nine, uh, 900 euros per square meter. So we were, uh, we were thinking a lot in developing this thing in order to have only two molds to build the 10,000 square meters, because the mold is the most expensive thing. And we were trying to, be, to, to, to read the building as a huge lattice of three different scales. So when the, the human scale or the closed scale is related to this texture, this is the, the scale of the collectivity with all these lattice, like, that is like the stretch of the other one, where we, you have these levels in relationship to the table or when you stand up, etc. And this lattice, which is the scale of the, of the city. So from far, you see these holes. When you're in the park, you see these holes. When you're in the building, close to the building, you see these things. So in, a, in a, all the scales, when you approach the buildings, to the building, you're always feeling these lattices. This, uh, when we write the building one meter, and modifying a little bit the topography in order to, to avoid uh, directly the one meter next to the building, we were generating these plazas, no? as I was telling you before. So these are spaces that are controlled or they are embraced uh, with the building, but at the same time we feel that we are in the park. So finally the building, a rise, a rise one meter, is belonging to the, all the park. No? Only solved, as I told, with these two moles, which is uh, 1.2 per 4.2. So everything above one meter is related to the prefab system to the te tectonics uh, approach, and everything below is to the stereotomic approach. No? So as you can see, so constantly the building is trying to be related to the park in this way. No? And trying to, to avoid the, the lecture of the joints, trying to be hidden because the, the shadows, and trying to express the, the, the orientation, and trying to express the change of uh, weather where, uh, through the change of shadows and lights. When the, the building is touching ground, it's trying to avoid his, uh, its heaviness, and then you find the big open openings that are related to the, collect the more collective spaces, which are the libraries, the cafeteria, etc. And in the first floor is where we have all the classrooms. So all the classrooms are together in order to, to have some kind of uh, some kind of a community, you know? so I'm try, trying to avoid this segmentation of four studies and trying to, to find some kind of a square or piazza, inner piazza, where all the knowledge is shared. This is the inner space, so when we were seeing the fragmentation in the facade, we're obtaining that the inner facades are coinciding with the upper facades, you know? so we have always natural light in our spaces. But in fact, what we wanted to, to do is to avoid that, you know, to avoid this kind of schemes. You know, sometimes that you have a circulation, so you have the same amount of facade for the circulation than for the classrooms. And at the same time, this circulation is always too wide to circulate, and it's too thin or too narrow to be a collective space. So for us, that could be a, a nice thing, you know, in terms of an, ab an abstract way. We have more perimeter for the classroom, less perimeter inside, and finally, this is not a corridor, this is a piazza. 
But obviously, this is not something that dialogue with the open space. There is not a door, because the diameter is always the longest distance in, a, in the circle. And a part of that is that we have always, with this convex situation, we're not invited to pass. So this, that was always, again, the idea of the door. So we're trying to work with this uh, more fragmented facade, more polygonal, in order to have more facade for the, open, for the outside facade, and inside, like a, some kind of sort of a small piazzas connected to the studies, different studies. But obviously, everything, all these geometries related to the, to the context. So this bar is, trying, is being parallel to the Congress Hall in order to generate like a, like a huge plaza, huge, a huge door, huge threshold in the entrance of the campus. And because this Congress Hall doesn't have a bar, the bar is here, this campus doesn't have an auditorium, the auditorium is here, so they are sharing things, so the geometry is shared in the building. Too. And the other one, the other bar is related to the three housing blocks that are in the, pla in the, in the, in the park. And they are trying to be in the same distance, more or less, in order to, be, to avoid to be related to one of them. So this is related to the system of the three. So only provoking that, not only provoking that you have always some kind of open uh, concavities, you are related to this place. No? So, and this is the profile of the plot that we had for the competition. So finally, the plot is what is not important. So the building is to be being built in the, inside the plot, but is not being built uh, only related to the plot. So finally, as I told you, the concave areas are open in order to cross the, that spaces, and the convex points are with uh, big openings in order to, uh, to provoke lightness in the concrete mass. So from outside, it's like um, this beautiful tree. Have a, this, this uh, leaves that are gray in one side, green in the other side. So when the, you have this wind, sometimes you see gray and green. And we wanted to play in the same way. So from outside, you're playing with the shadows and the gray. And when you are inside, you see the lattice, etc. When you are inside, you're related to the, to the, to the green. And again, with a very, th very easy and simple decisions, like two kind of spans, the 9.5 related to the, to the big classrooms. So you have all the, the, the columns here in order that you can divide that in different ways. The small classrooms, 5.5 meters for span, and then rotating in order to avoid the long views, in order to provoke the small piazzas. And obviously, that allow us to fragment the building in section from more flat to more fragmented. More vertical related to the city and the Congress Hall, lower related to the park. And all the servant areas were together in order to generate some kind of belt, a belt that provokes a thickness, a filter, in between the noisy areas and the silent areas. So all, again, the building itself, the, the briefing, the program, is becoming a threshold, a door in between two spaces, in between the continuity of the park, which is the space, and the thickness of the facade, which are the classrooms. So we could understood the building as this, and the inner space as a continuity of the park. Because again, the ceiling roof has different heights in order to generate, to, to give a natural light inside. Here we can see how there are different kind of uh, ways of entering natural light from the huge one, which is the, the main stair that connects the ground floor with the first floor, so the common areas with the classrooms. From this level, we have the, the, the departments and the, the offices. So this space is understood as the inner piazza. No, we generate this, uh, we moved that column in order to avoid the column in the, in the corner, in order to generate the common space for the students. And here we could see how, how the, we have this rhythm of natural light. No? We have natural light, and then we have this diployer ceiling, which is 3.5, natural light, 3.5, 6.5, 2.5. So we have a rhythm 
of a cenital floor that provokes that we feel that we are like a, some kind of a, an open and closed space, exterior and inner space. Thank you very much. So to introduce ourselves, uh, I'm Claire Gallagher, this is John Dale. Uh, we were co-chairs of the CAE School Design Awards this year. We were both on the jury last year. John is um, a practicing architect in California. I am trained as an architect, taught design, and now I teach in the School of Education. So I have one foot in each pond. Um, in preparing for this presentation, we've been doing this now for months, feels like years, uh, we began talking and comparing notes about the, both of the processes, the jury from the previous year and the jury from this year. And John lives and works in Los Angeles, and I live and work in New Jersey. We had a large number of projects to discuss, because this year particularly, there was a very strong group of submissions, very good projects. 120, actually. Yes, 120. Uh, so we decided on basic themes that we've seen emerging in American school design and narrowed the list of projects down. We both arrived yesterday and in 24 hours we've had a whole series of epiphanies. The first one is that we were not presenting two days from now, we were presenting today. That was our first epiphany. <laughs> our second epiphany was that we thought we had 15 minutes between us, as it turns out we have 30. That was our second epiphany. And while working until 3 a.m. this morning, we realized how many 1960s TV program theme songs we actually know and sang quite a few of them. Um, but most importantly, we noticed that the most successful school designs, the ones that bubbled up and emerged, were the ones in which the synergy between the pedagogy and the school design were clearly evident in the student appropriation of spaces. And that's what we began to see. We were discussing why were these more successful than these when there were a number of strong submissions. So uh, just a little brief history of this issue of synergy. About 15 years ago when I became involved in this organization, um, I began looking at pedagogy and school design. That's my area of research and my area of expertise. And the pedagogy was well ahead of the school design at that point. But architects were very eager to learn more about that. Then little by little, the school design started to catch up with the innovations in pedagogy. And most recently, the design side has surged ahead of the pedagogy side. So that we are seeing the need for the pedagogy to keep up. And in the US, it's a political issue. There are a number of others, other issues embedded in this. But um, I would be particularly pleased if this synergy were true across the board. So John is going to, to talk about the, the awards. Yes, no, th that's fine. So um, the uh, Committee on Architecture for Education Design Awards seek to honor project innovation and excellence uh, through a number of different um, focus areas, the enhancement of the client's educational program through planning and design, the integration of the local environment and respect for the surrounding community as integral parts of the design and learning experience, understanding of social and emotional needs of learners and reflecting them in the physical spaces. And finally, a demonstrated commitment to sustainability through a holistic and integrated design approach. So we decided that um, we want, we are, I want to make it clear we're not announcing award winners tonight. No. Um, we are looking at a variety of projects, uh, all of which we consider to be very strong 
for different reasons. So this is not, however, we did think it might be interesting um, for you to, th to think about how, when you see the images of different schools, how you respond to them. And we thought, therefore, that the first images that we show, uh, we'd, like to we'd like you to respond and tell us you know, what you think of these particular projects. So the, this first one is actually uh, a zero-net energy project, the uh, Lady Bird Johnson School in Texas. And I'm going to show you these two images. Um, would anybody care to comment? What's your take on these? Interesting observation. <laughs> ding, ding, we have a winner. <laughs> there's, no right, there's no right answer, by the way. No, there is not. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, that, I think these are all good observations. I think that what we have is a very complete image, which in this particular case perhaps puts the, the child in a bit of a passive situation, but a project with enormous accomplishment. Oh, this is the finest image. This is the final image in this sequence, which I think maybe speaks to the same yes. comments that we heard. Um, another school. This is an, uh, this is actually uh, a very exemplary restoration project uh, in Baton Rouge, a high school that's been completely restored. Any comment? I think I think you've got it. I, I think that, and and the comment was made earlier by one of our our colleagues from uh, Catalonia that um, this is still very much a part of the context in which we work. We are still dealing with um, many um, school uh, providers who who wish to have an environment which is quite controlled and ordered in this way. I mean, you think about student appropriation of those spaces. I think it's unlikely. Um, this is a school, uh, a, one of the green dot schools in Los Angeles, um, a highly sustainable school with some comment. There are a few images of this. Any comments? There is no one right answer. <laughs> Blue. Blue. This is a good audience. It's a very good audience. Um, as I say, there are no right answers, but I think what we wanted you to do is to sit with us, you know, from your perspective to see how we start to respond and look at things. No, I, we are not going to go much longer in this. But, so there's no. one comment that this was a, a very appealing environment. Any other comments? Yes, it's very big. And it's, I'd say it's likely that it's happening with the It's like special. It is a very different thinking feature in American schools and in the Even spans are usually large areas. Yeah. And there's one thing that's perhaps a little point about this is um, the Irving School in Joplin, California, so it actually replaced school that was destroyed by tornadoes, so Joplin, Missouri, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, What's wrong with this? Comment on this particular picture. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is a featured photograph, and it's a green roof, and those kids are looking very longingly. Okay, that was the audience participation. Uh, now we'll move forward. So, so um, what we want to do now is to, again, um, this, is, this is not about winners and losers. This is about a series of projects that were exemplary in a variety of ways. But we wanted to address the theme that we were handed 
to talk about spatial quality in relationship to pedagogical innovation and sustainability. And some of these projects are focused more on one than the other. So let's start with spatial quality. And we're also hoping to um, be a little bit more provocative in this discussion or conversation as it was suggested. Uh, that in the end we have several things that we'd like you to consider as what's coming or what might be coming. So um, this is, a, this is a, a great example of a vertical school and this is something that as our big cities in America are becoming more urbanized, uh, the William Jones College Prep School in Chicago, um, and, and uh, you know, this is, you know, iconic Chicago architecture um, expressed even in, in graphics, uh, uh, very accomplished, uh, very beautifully executed, very heroic in its spaces. And I'm just going to flip through them. Claire, do you want to just make it? I think we're really, time, yeah, a, a typical classroom. I was responding to public transportation at the site, adjacency to it. And the great thing about Chicago, the rooftop swimming pools, magnificent um, space. So this is, you know, this is a, a project that um, is, is in a way, is a, is a very um, brilliant execution in a very difficult site. It is not um, changing, it's not reflecting changing pedagogy, it's reflecting a traditional model, but in a very uh, skilled way, it's, it's negotiating a very challenging site. And this is not the only vertical school we saw. This was a, a category that we saw bubbling up from the submissions. The roof garden. Okay. Um, here's another, um, uh, another um, urban school. In this case, uh, another uh, theme that we saw a lot of in entries and which is more and more reality of our country is adaptive reuse that we are we have a huge stock of schools all across the country that now have to be renewed having been neglected for decades and uh, and uh, although in this case this was not previously a school this was a this is a, a kind of amazing transformation of a factory building in an industrial part of um, Baltimore So a, a factory, and, and I think uh, in this, one of the things that struck us about this school is that it is an adaptive reuse that, that leaves the structure of this building very much intact. The quality of spaces, there's almost an archaeological quality to the way you see um, the underlying layers of the original building and the way in which new things are layered in a very... Uh, clear way. The spaces are very lofty and very open and one senses that this could continue. We, we're not sure that, that, there, that the pedagogy is so much the driver but certainly the spirit and the intent of renewal are and um, the sense that this could continue to evolve over time seems to us to be a powerful suggestion. Also a word that we talked about was one of edginess, um, edginess in a positive sense, in the, 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 they're, they're, we believe that this is the kind of school that the kids can appropriate for themselves because it, it feels like it is sort of their world. do and of course we're not we're not announcing awards one way or the other this oh, evening. No. but um, I think that I think it clearly is a lively environment uh, I mean I think you depend on smaller classes but I think it's probably one of the challenges right right Thinking about transparency between spaces, yet still providing sound, uh, uh, stopping sounds. So you can still see, but you can't 
Let's continue. This is another adaptive reuse project. Uh, in this case, a college of media arts and design and uh, a former Robert Venturi design building. Denise Scott Brown. Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. <laughs> Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire. Welcome, John. And, um, and so this is a decorated shed which has been very dramatically transformed, basically turned inside out. Uh, a project which suggests um, rather than a series of discrete planes, it's now a highly interactive uh, set of interconnected spaces. Um, analysis of the way the program intersects with these, these programs intersect three-dimensionally within the volume. And uh, very much a, a, a very flexible loft-like space. Um, we've already dealt with the uh, issue of acoustics, so probably we need to revisit it here, but it may be a, a similar issue. Uh, and, and this is the, you know, this seems genuinely a place where things are happening along the kind of trays which are, are part of the circulation system. They're obviously more than hallways. Lots of display space, lots of transparency, lots of interconnection. All right, we're going to move through this because we have to. Um, so let's talk, um, shift the focus to pedagogical innovation. Um, and uh, we're interested really in where we see a resonance between design and pedagogy. Uh, here we are going to the northwest um, to Wilkes Elementary School on Bainbridge Island near Seattle, Washington. Uh, and, and here we see... Um, a series of interconnected spaces, a great deal of transparency, a great deal of attention to detail, but at the same time a great deal of intimacy, and the idea that um, children can move uh, into shared spaces very easily that are associated with the individual classrooms, um, that there is a great deal of interconnection with the landscape, and the landscape flows through the section of the building. Um, a, a library which of course has been transformed into something much more of a place to study during the day before and after school. But the, I think probably the scale and the intimacy of these spaces are, are particularly noteworthy. Um, and how that's managed with a very simple and disciplined material palette. Claire? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm having a very good time looking at these again. Uh, <laughs> the issue of transparency that Steve was talking about is one that we see, and uh, in reviewing these and going over them again last night, there's a, a regional aspect to this that's very interesting. A, a tremendous number of um, successful designs are coming from the Pacific Northwest in the U.S. And there are various reasons for that. Well, yeah, I mean, there's clearly, um, there's, there's clearly um, a, a group of, of firms in the Northwest that are very thoughtful school designers. We were almost overwhelmed by the number and quality of schools that kind of fall into this category. Um, and um, so, uh, pedagogy well understood, school districts that are good clients, that are willing to explore the aspects of school design thoroughly and, and support them, I think, adequately. Um, here's another one. This is another, um, uh, uh, actually, another uh, sort of an adaptive reuse, a re renovation of an existing school that dates back to the 60s and a, an example of a dramatic transformation, one that is pedagogically driven. Uh, this was, um, you know, a kind of system school which um, had some bones to work with. It had courtyards. It had a kind of precast system that, that set the rhythm of its phase. But it was actually a pretty closed system. You can see on the left, this was how the facade was treated, and it was actually 
turned inside out. It was made very transparent. It was um, made to breathe where before it had been closed. And, and the courtyards are now not just dead spaces, but are actually very much program spaces, interactive spaces. This school ends up having a series of little nodes at all different scales throughout, throughout the um, school, throughout the floor plan, where interaction takes place in small groups or larger groups and forums. And that is, that is the interesting, this is, this is what, what seems to be an embodiment of, of really taking the traditional double-loaded corridor and turning it inside out and really making different kinds of spaces um, where kids can learn independently and with each other. And again, there's actually a kind of, I mean, this is the West Coast version maybe of, of edginess, which somehow seems to fit well with these kids. Another example from the Northwest, and in this case, we, one of the things that, that we've seen emerging um, strongly, again, is the idea of career tech education. Um, we were talking about this, that we used to call this vocational school. Um, it, it, at a certain point in the history of American education, um, educators set about to train kids to be, you know, useful workers in the real world, and we had great auto tech facilities and all kinds of things in our high schools to support that, and then that changed, and we kind of got away from that, and those spaces lay empty until technology came and transformed the way kids learned and experimented, and these became the new spaces for robotics and digital media and so on. And I also think that in an effort to address the, um, the current inadequacies, let's say, in American education, there have been a number of things that have gone on, and one of them, well, there are magnet schools, there are charter schools, there are lots of different focuses in schools that have to do with thematic approaches, inquiry-based instruction, problem-based learning, project-based learning, and it's all in an effort to drive it more towards student-centered learning versus teacher-driven learning. But um, it's fine to say that. It's another thing to do it. And teacher education, I think, is the next thing that's going to have to budge to really make that happen in such a way that it's effective. And this is where, as I said, the, the architecture side, the design side's ahead. It's ahead, and it's pushing in that direction. So um, these thematic schools, whether they are career academies or whether they're, um, they're career tech or whatever they are, they're all really derived from the same, the same push, the same point of view. So this is a school that actually sits on an airport runway and, and uh, has um, activities surrounding um, a whole series of, of um, programs that relate to um, skills associated with the aviation industry. The center is a forum, which is a very flexible space. You know, it's a very tight footprint. There are no playgrounds. There aren't the usual array of spaces that support typical public high schools. And so this space has to do just about everything. Um, a robotics lab, you know, wind tunnel, uh, to, um, in this case, this, this place of study at a countertop is a bit like a control tower. And this building is sandwiched in between an aviation museum on one side and the airport on the other. Uh, in with even, even though this is a very tight plan, there are these these uh, more casual interactive areas which are part of the passageways connecting the classrooms. And then there's a kind of tongue-in-cheek thing that's going on with graphics. Um, we don't know how staged this photograph was, probably pretty staged, but... Um, mo moving along the same theme, here is one that kind of ratchets up a notch. This is the, uh, the Blue Valley Center for Advanced Professional Studies in Overland Park, Kansas. Uh, so we moved to the center of the country. And this is uh, actually almost like a kind of corporate loft building with a linear atrium that connects all floors and two very flexible bars on either side with wide balconies on which a series of independent activities take place. A forum, the big stairs in the middle, 
for presentations and um, spaces that are a bit like corporate boardrooms in some cases, depending on what the theme and the focus of the program is, as well as um, perhaps more conventional science labs and, and maker spaces. So um, moving to the third of the themes, um, sustainability. Um, which is embodied in many of the projects we've already shown to greater or lesser degrees. Um, here's, here's an interesting example, one where we really think sustainability is serving as part of the curriculum, is very well integrated. This is uh, Penn State University, the Hort Woods Child Care Center and Lab School. Uh, and it's interesting, this presentation is very much a narrative. Uh, very different from many of the other presentations we looked at. And it really is all about the integration of curriculum. There's also um, very detailed um, narrative on site integration, the way in which indoor um, learning spaces merge out into outdoor learning spaces. And these are very detailed. These are, these are um, you know, perhaps the opposite of some of the very beautiful, serene, and abstract spaces that we've been presented with this evening, uh, which you can see in the kind of um, detailed textures and, and you know, intricately defined activities. Um, the story about how the building breathes, how the building works, um, the character of the classrooms, and I think this la these are some of the things that become part and parcel of the way children learn in this place. The idea of making something out of the collection of rainwater, of actually having the opportunity to collect it, to understand how, where it comes from and how it's collected, or ventilation as an activity in the class. Um, Signaling, signaling when you can open or should open a window to benefit from the breeze and the temperature, understanding its effect. This becomes part and parcel of the way the children learn about sustainability in their environment. Claire, did you want to add anything? No. Okay. I know I'm um, looking at, the, at my watch. Yeah, how are we doing? We're okay. okay. All right. But I'm the police. Um, over to North Carolina. Um, Buckingham Primary and Elementary School. This is a, a very interesting um, case study of a school. This is actually um, the, the reuse and recycling of existing schools and its radical transformation into something new and inviting and very much developed around the theme of sustainability and very specifically around nutrition. And in this case, um, there is a mission to fight obesity, uh, which is which becomes an overriding theme that is very successfully woven throughout the school, both in terms of spaces and graphics. And, and then there's a, a kind of research partnership going on with the county health authorities to really make this um, evidence-based uh, design. So the, the floor plate, which combines new and old rather seamlessly, um, some of the classroom interiors, uh, some of the recycled spaces, which were kind of inherently deep and dark, which have become places of discovery. And then the, 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 the cafeteria is now a place of beauty and dignity, um, very much connected to the outside. This is not like the school cafeteria that I experienced growing up, that's for sure. And lots of different kinds of spaces for more intimate small group activity, again, in integrated and woven throughout the plan. We're almost through. Almost. Um, and we're back in the Northwest, and that maybe tells you that we had such a, uh, an astonishing array of schools to look at from there. This, this is, uh, we thought we should talk about prefabricated modular structures 
this is a STEM secondary school in Redmond, Washington, which is an example of a modular structure. It was designed before the site was identified. It was built very quickly. And um, I think the, maybe the question is, and one that struck us, is that there was somehow um, a skillful um, interaction between the architects and this system to create something that has a real sense of place and is... John, some, some people here don't know what STEM is. Oh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And then there's STEAM, which adds the arts. And then there's STEAM AA, which adds... I mean, it keeps going, but... Um, <laughs> but STEM is a big deal. Yeah, we saw quite a America. few uh, submissions, STEM and STEAM. So this is a modular structure which is actually peppered with a series of double height forum spaces. Um, we get a, an image of the construction and, and some of the, the interactive spaces that weave through the plan. And again, there managed to be spaces, those um, extra spaces, where um, some of the most serious learning goes on between classes and, and in parallel to classes. And STEM is a national initiative. Um, there is quite a bit of money that's been dedicated to STEM education, particularly for girls. And then there's blended learning. So Claire, why don't you this finish is, this one? <laughs> blended learning is, uh, it's an interesting, this was one of the projects that we discussed for a very long time. And it is kind of throwing everything on its head. Um, the idea of having children commute to school and having dedicated spaces for either one-on-one -on -one or group instruction that's face-to-face -face instruction, but yet the rest of it is all online learning. And it was provocative. We were discussing it from the, the provocative point of view and then looking at this spatially. Uh, I don't know what you think of this. I'll refrain from giving you my own spin on it, but uh, it's, there's a lot of space in here. A tremendous amount. A lot of it is undifferentiated. Um, well, it's actually black box retail. Do you know what yeah. black box retail is? Um, so this is a, a direct product of the recession. As, as retail malls failed in America, they became the experimental breeding grounds for new kinds of learning spaces. And so there are a number of examples like this. This is one that was uh, probably the most noteworthy one that we came across. And often it's said that uh, these schools are for disaffected children or children who might be bullied, not wanting to go to school, and this gives them an option uh, for, in some cases, in some states, in Pennsylvania, for instance, it's K-12, K-12 online education. But again, I think you can see that for um, kids who are learning at their own speed and who are very technology focused, uh, you know, I think you could see the potential of this being a very kind of comfortable extension of their homeschooling. I think there's a question maybe of scale, scale and uh, um, natural light, sense of orientation, many things that come to play in terms of evaluating spaces like that. So, you know, this is where we got to um, in our delirium last night. Um, but we, it doesn't represent all the amazing projects we had to look at. There are also a lot more higher ed uh, projects that we have looked at and evaluated. But we wanted to talk specifically to the themes of this evening. We hope this has given you some insight into our world and what's going on there. Stay, stay. Very much so, actually. Uh, it's been very interesting for us to have this perspective on, on the production uh, in America. You know, we don't get these, um, to know these projects or the prices or publications about it. So it's which is something that we have to 
to sit to it and try to dress. <laughs> okay. We need more international webinars, don't we? We should be. Yeah. We, I think we need to get some things going, and we would be happy to help make those happen with our wonderful Washington staff. <laughs> we have great ability to put on this thing, so we, need to, we just need to find the right time of day that will work for Spain and uh, California. <laughs> okay. I'm sure there will be some comments or observations that you want to make from either side. Can, can I ask a question that's kind of a outline or in America? Yes. And it's to do with the big ace work, sustainability. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I mention it is that I spent the later part of the afternoon with Dave Mackay, who's a friend of mine, uh, from Martin Albahigas Mackay, and you showed two of his schools. And he asked me, what I'd missed, and I said I'd missed a seminar on sustainability, and he said, well, you wouldn't have missed very much then. No. Now, the difficulty with the big S for sustainability is that it's something that every architect who has ever worked as an architect should be interested in, and it's become something that's now been parceled, and it has its own separate entity within the study and the, the prize winning of architecture, when it's something which is inherent to architecture and everything we actually do. And that's a worrying aspect because you now have people who specialise in sustainability. And, and schools are judged on their lead performance, I think it is, is that the American performance? And I've seen some fantastic schools which are lead gold standard, but some really dreadful schools in the United States that are also lead gold standard. So lead sustainability has become the, the measure by which we seem to measure the performance of a piece of architecture when it shouldn't be. It should even be categorised. It should be something that we're all, as architects, fundamentally interested in. That's in the, the performance of the building, the appropriateness of the materials, the context of the building, whether it's fit for purpose. If the building lasts for 50 years, the students are happy in it, they're thriving in it, it will serve the teacher. It doesn't matter how it's built, it's sustainable. It's socially sustainable. And that's a worrying thing. Not only uh, seems to be it's addressing architects in America, but it's also something which is addressing architects in the UK. And it's a worrying aspect of it, because it's something that I don't think we should even mention. <laughs> well, one comment I do have to make is that, that in a way, um, education architecture has, in the United States has been shaped by waves. And I, I, one of the things that I find now in my own practice is that we are looking at buildings that were conceived to be great places of learning because of the way natural light was handled and ventilation and so on. And there was a very large, you know, there was a huge effort to try and make livable schools. Perhaps at the time in the 1950s and 60s when these schools were being conceived, not all the, all the ingredients were very well integrated into that, but, um, but the, there, was a, there was a humanity to those spaces that is actually recoverable in some cases. So, but I, I think it is maybe the tendency of movements to be focused on one or another thing that, that kind of drives that imbalance. Hmm. To build less and to build smaller and as our architects we don't want to accept that we want to look and I myself was able to design um, buildings uh, which are platinum uh, lead platinum and I have to say that I enjoy this uh, three-story atrium and this uh, beautiful green wall and the, you know the uh, wood ceiling and the, the um, teaching spaces which are almost cathedral like and they will still have platinum for it. And I think that the schools that we saw this morning, especially this morning, they are very modest schools. And I think that this is a lesson that we all should take away. Because if you look at our, uh, the best examples of the, the old houses and the houses that we design now, even they are really beautiful, but they're all huge. The same happened with our schools. We have all kinds of spaces and myself I'm still designing I think more than students need this is just what the money all that the state money and provincial money can afford so I would like to kind of uh, discuss with colleagues the more European perspective of smaller 
spaces and uh, the schools who can, that can deliver for uh, less. Welcome to the land of austerity. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, now we are in a very dire straits here in Spain, as you may know, but it's always been, the, I would say, I don't know if my colleagues would agree, but <clears throat> I'd say that the best architecture, not only um, educational, but residential or uh, or public architecture, etc. The best architecture in Europe is probably public funded, publicly funded. It's probably stems from administration uh, investments, so, and it is basically based on a very low budget. So this is, we'd like to work in America, actually. <laughs> <laughs> It seems to me that there's a common thread uh, this evening um, with your initial comments and and our comments from the educator that that uh, and also uh, the award well actually not award winning projects but the ones that you've selected to share with us uh, that there's a story to be told uh, by these projects and I and I think that that's something about our human nature that we we relate to stories, and and um, and I think the idea that every educator in a school should know what the story is and know what they're trying to communicate to students is is a powerful one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a movement in in uh, in the states now, and it's specifically very strong in California. It's the uh, charter schools, and and these charter schools they start up. They're publicly funded, but they start up with a story. There's someone that that feels they have a better idea on how to educate children. And uh, there's no money for those schools uh, to build schools. But, but I, I think it's an, a, a compelling idea that every school, uh, that every student goes to should have a story and something that they're trying to communicate to them. What do you think, Carlos? Let's talk about uh, price per. Order. Order. Mm -hmm. An order. Yeah. One million. Okay. Uh, in schools, we, we work. Our bricks are called uh, pedagogical units, which means uh, 15 hours of delivery classes. Okay. In a professional way, uh, this could cost ten thousand dollars. So I think in in every building, every work in school, uh, it should be compulsory. Uh, to make an effort for the community to understand what's going on there uh, for the kids and also for the students. So, uh, I mean, and, uh, uh, that could uh, improve, that could be a, an amplifier or a pipe for, for your work. And lots of students are going to a building and they don't know anything about 
this building, uh, which is the story, who built it, why uh, a wall is there, or whatever. So I think in, in every one of your work, if, if it's for education, uh, you have an opportunity to, to make a small effort or to contract another one uh, just to explain what's going on uh, there. That should be completely compulsory and it's, it's what we call a significant learning uh, for the students. Something I mean, it, it's really easy uh, to engage a student uh, explaining uh, something he is looking uh, every day. No? So for me, it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea. It's something it, it should be it should be done, and it could dignify uh, your profession because uh, most of the kids in the world go to the school. So it could be great. You know, I will tell you a story. <laughs> um, I've done several uh, buildings for the Catalan government, uh, for schools and so on, different sorts, from, from pre-grade to high school and so on. <coughs> and all of the time I've been told not to talk with a specific team that's going to run them. It's almost contractually based that they cannot talk to them, you know. They cannot discuss with them certain things. So there is a top-down approach which is totally... That's, that's an amazing error. You've shown a picture here of Stau School. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an idea uh, behind that school, okay? Uh, I think five or six years after the building was built, the, ch the teachers asked for walls because they felt insecure just uh, working there. And now in Tau there are walls. So uh, I, I couldn't imagine Boigas, McKay going there and saying, oh, we're going on. That, that's, that's what, that, that wasn't the initial idea. So there's a risk on that, okay? But I think there's an opportunity also. I think that the only way uh, to get a good use is, is, is to make an effort uh, of the community to understand what's going on there. That implies leadership, uh, an amazing board, or, or whatever. But, and I have to tell you something else. A building needs always someone that loves it. And you can tell by just entering into a building if it is well taken care of or not, if it's loved or not, it's immediately. Can I ask you, what you're saying there is unpleasant because I didn't get an impression from any of the presentations what they would be different. What can you say about the whole thing? It seems to be written by an occupational parent and not the many constitutions that have a picture of the world. It's a pity uh, we don't have the opportunity than, uh, uh, to have the first step that needs to have the relation with the client. Our client, it's something, it's not the, uh, the team, uh, the, the, the teachers are, our client, it's more like a, a, for a contractor building, uh, I try to, to explain in this way. You explain something very nice. This is you can close the circle. It's not only talk with the client. Also, it's to uh, uh, communicate with the kids uh, to understand uh, how uh, they can enjoy more the, the building and the spaces and and all of that. But in uh, in this moment, uh, it's one reality. Our uh, schools, our public schools, we don't have this opportunity, then uh, I think it's very important. I, one thing I want to say is it, it wasn't something that we talked about in our presentation, but many of the projects that we showed were in fact the result of a very intensive process of interaction between the architects and teachers and even children, and there were elaborate workshops and, and so on. And, Many of these processes have been pretty well recorded in the narratives of these projects. So there is an underlying story. And I think the schools that are the most human are probably the ones that reflect that process the best. And there are a lot of examples in the states of those. Well, you showed us some really good work. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, your work was really good. But my question to you is, if you did have the opportunity to interact with your end users, which is your teachers and the students, do you think that the process would, end, uh, would help you design something different from what you showed us?
uh, that means that uh, we have to understand uh, the demanding and uh, to translate in, in a space. It's not an uh, answer very uh, directly. We have to, uh, and uh, that means that, uh, but it's, it's our work, but sometimes the client doesn't want and we make the so deep work. They made only in one uh, direction. In uh, our schools, uh, they have, uh, they want to, to, probably they want to have a very standard way uh, that every school has to be the same class, the same corridor with the same size. It's for that than uh, my presentation, then sorry, it's really fast, but uh, I try to explain in, this, in the part that we have more opportunity to offer things for the school and the architecture and the, and the site and the town, no? then it's uh, how the organization of this uh, very standard part of the, the schools that we have to make. And it's the, the classrooms are really close and really defined, the sizes, the, the high, all the measures. And of course, what say Enrique, it, the, our budget, it's really different of your budget. Uh, it's a really uh, low budget, uh, our, our project, but, but yeah. okay, <clears throat> it's ours. Uh, we can explore and uh, we can uh, improve uh, the questions from uh, the architecture in, in our commissions. It, uh, we are very excited to, to do that. Mm. Actually, I have to... The, the, the questions that you explain, it's a dream, it's the whole uh, process. <laughs> Sometimes we made uh, it. Uh, we try to to go to the school, and uh, the first one I am very exciting because the the mayor of this city they use a lot the courtyard like a piazza. They made the fireworks in the San Juan in the solstice in the summer solstice. They use the the courtyard for to make uh, fireworks and uh, many things because it's so well located and so well orientated to the south, then it's a pleasure to be there, no? This is uh, the things that uh, it's more from, it's, then the pedagogy can be well there, if, it, if it's well orientated, if it's the scale of the things works well, and, uh, and I try to make in my presentation then uh, one school, can be something more than a school, can be something that the uh, community can use uh, in the weekends, in the, how one part of the city. It's not a monofunctional uh, facility. It's more than that. It's a piece of the town. It's a piece of the landscape. This is, uh, I think, can be the, the school. Huh? Can I add, um, add one more thing to, to our discussion? Because uh, I think Claire mentioned evidence-based evidence design, and this is very fashionable now, but I would like to hear how you architects or, or people here, uh, what, what is the evidence you are looking for, what, and how, what is the measurement? So, because it's fashionable, everybody talks about it, but how, what, what are the evidences we are looking for and how to measure them? So um, one of the, I mean, to me, the biggest impact is obviously the, the benefit to the learning outcomes for the children, right? That, that is the ultimate goal. So um, not only test scores, but in terms of their improvement from grade to grade. So um, being able to track the benefits of daylighting, there's numerous research, uh, there's a lot of research out there about the impacts, for example, of daylighting on test scores and things of that nature. Um, but it really is about, first of all, understanding pedagogically what you're trying to achieve and then measuring against that. Because ultimately we can design the best buildings in the world, but if there isn't a, a paradigm shift in how teaching is happening in those spaces, then you're not going to be successful. So I really think it has to be that continuum of the link between pedagogy and architecture that really makes a project sing. And teacher education. And Ideally, 
ideally, you, um, you want to populate a building with teachers who are not going to be teaching around it. They're going to be teaching with it. Uh, that's a tough, tough, tough match. And there, in, in American teacher education, I was going to ask the question about here, there are teachers, I would say most people in my classes come in with a preconception of what teaching is, and it's very autocratic, very autocratic. So when you talk about putting up walls, that to me is a clear sign of that that is not a good match between pedagogy and the design of the school. But how do you populate your schools with teachers? And the states were sometimes driven by the fact that not only um, our te teacher education in general is pretty much the same everywhere. Not everywhere, but pretty much. Um, but then the teachers unions are on top of that. So you really don't have any choice in choosing people because you must go from that particular pool of people to populate the schools in the town. So how do you do it here? I think we have the, the same problem, mm -hmm. okay? The point here is that uh, to, to, to run uh, the, the, the buildings you've shown us imply a more complex model mm -hmm. than a corridor room-based building. I mean, it's a, a matter of entropy, okay? There's, and, and to manage entropy in school, it it's implies uh, more competences as a professional. Mm -hmm. So the paradigm it completely changes. But the point is, um, the, the, the key point is the, the culture of the organization. And the culture of the organization, I'm talking about kids mm -hmm. and teachers, is not the culture of the buildings you've shown us here. So we're talking about changing that culture. And changing a culture means leadership, uh, long-term initiatives. It's not only a matter of, of, of training. And a lot of risk. Uh, parents a lot, a lot don't of risk. always want to take risks yeah. with their kids. And long-term, OK? Uh, so uh, you need to assume risk. I mean, in, in our school, we open the doors at half seven. And there, there's nobody uh, looking at the kids. Because they're supposed to, to be there correctly. That's a risk. Uh, that's the big step, I mean, <laughs> to use this correctly, uh, you, you need, you need to, 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 to build a freedom uh, atmosphere which is really difficult and if, if you put the decisions on the teachers, that is not going to happen for sure. But I mean, you need to, to find a balance between decision and, you know. Mm -hmm. Attending the ownership over to the, the children for their learning. Yeah, that's a great discussion. I think if you look a little further down the road, now I'm not an educator like you are, but what I see happening is that the technology, this wave of technology that we're on, whether we're on the back of the wave or on the front of the wave or we're being drowned in the tide, um, it's providing teachers with tools that give them kind of unprecedented ability to personalize and uh, learning for each student. And as that happens and it becomes an easier, it's becoming easier and easier for teachers to do that. And I think, at least in the U.S., um, we're seeing that parents and students as consumers of education are starting to demand that. That um, I think, you know, setting aside our, our immediate issues, I think a lot of what you've shown is pointing towards is that this architecture we're looking for is um, is looking to create great spaces for this individual learning to happen and also great spaces for this social learning to happen. And I think what we're doing here, my work included, is kind of nibbling around the edges of the traditional model towards that idea. And um, I think in a lot of ways, nibbling is probably what we have to do because revolution is not going to work. You got to do it incrementally. So I really, I'm optimistic. I see that happening right now, and I think technology, whether we like it or not, is going to drive us that way. I think another thing that that will make a very big difference is when we get to the point where we do have some kind of way to measure the success of a building beyond building performance diagnostics issues. When we're able to really, not necessarily quantify, but even to know what we're looking for when it comes to how well is this building performing in, um, in facilitating learning. How, how yeah, about the memories that. of the students of that building? Yeah. I mean, I think an important goal for an architect designing a school is to make it memorable in the good sense. Mm -hmm. 
for the students and the professors. I mean, when I remember where I studied, which was not a very innovative place, but it was an old school with all these halls, a little bit like Harry Potter stuff, you know. Then that's memorable, you know. I mean, perhaps because there is a story behind it, there is a narrative to which to you stick, and there is a whole sense of belonging that in more impersonal spaces, with impersonal materials, with, it's possibly more difficult to reach, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and there are some interesting studies that have been done in the past oh, six or seven years that have to do with things like that. Like memory, smell memories. How did your school smell? And all sorts of things that children, Different age children have been asked this question, and their their memories, their olfactory memories, are fascinating. And what's embedded in a school design that taps into that? Not just what you see, but what you've heard, what you smell, what you remember, all your senses, what you remember. So does it boil down in the end to uh, what does our society gain of the kids that have gone to school, uh, socially, culturally, economically, and in Western Europe and the United States, you really have seen the societies grow uh, for better and for worse. Uh, but in a number of countries, uh, South America has a good example, uh, Asia, Africa on the bottom line, uh, education is still in its basic feet, still under the tree as you were showing. Uh, and they still need in maybe 50 years or 100 years of jump that we already made. And we can complain a little bit about it. But in the end, it's what the society went in it. Well, there, I think so there are two things school. embedded in what you're saying. One is, uh, and this is coming up in the States a lot, that the goal of school is good citizens. And how do you teach that? It's not just information. It's how do you teach someone to be a good citizen? And then if you're talking about other cultures, I think in teaching somebody to teach and looking at this, and the analogy between teaching somebody to design and teaching somebody to, to teach are so, it's so strong, it's amazing, now that I've done both for a while. Um, but a good teacher should be able to teach with a stick in the dirt. Yeah, yeah, the no, building I, should, should help you do it better, but if you're facile, you, you should be able to do that. See that. And I don't want to see all the buildings the same either. No. Let's turn out one unity uh, sausage. Uh, Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's plenty of empirical evidence to show us that the physical environment is important. It is. In the design of schools. But a few guys who were at the London conference remember um, the Minister for Education saying that it wasn't as good for them. I do too. The first thing was it was good for them. There's plenty of evidence. <laughs> it's just, it just doesn't suit the government to admit to the they want to build schools cheaply. It is, and I'm not certainly not undermining that at all. Not at all. And I, I think we're getting the cart before the horse a little bit, trying to evaluate whether the architecture is is right for education. I think we need more sophisticated tools to evaluate the success of the educational process and I think the architecture needs to understand that and respond to that and and that's where um, big challenges in the education area you know the piece that's of tests huge. tell you one thing but you need a lot more to kind of to understand if you're creating great citizens and improving society mm -hmm. how do you measure that <laughs> maybe we should as architects take that on Okay then. Creating a new society. Yeah. We've, got, we've got the eagle. <laughs> oh, well, this is sort of going back a couple of steps in our conversation, but I wanted to know if you knew of any examples, I guess, Claire, this would be for you, um, even anecdotally, where um, innovative school design actually changed the behavior of teachers and the way they teach. Because you said, you know, we need better teacher training, but I'm just wondering if any if the kinds of spaces they are working in have triggered any kind of new behaviors, if you're aware of that. No, oh. I'm not. As far as changing how somebody teaches, I'm not. It does. It does.
does. And ideally what you would have is you would have a lab school. Yeah. But I don't think that's the question. I think you're asking if it changed how people were teaching. Because that's different. Yeah, it's very different. No, I... Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Well, you would hope, but... Yes. Yeah. Right. And I thought your question was was more go go ahead, Paul. Well, I, was say, I, mean, I agree with Karina. you populate the school with people who are prepared to teach in that environment. And ideally, and we've talked about this before, ideally if you had a lab school where um, pre-service teacher education was preparing the, the people who were going to be going forward in a particular environment and a particular pedagogy, and then they populated the schools that represented that, that's golden. But we don't have that. I can tell you that students that I have coming into my classes, hold on, sorry, sorry, sorry. I've asked them, I've asked them for 15 years, when did you want to become a teacher and why do you want to be a teacher? And I've told this story before to some of you. Um, for 15 years I have heard, sadly, things like I want my summer off and I want the same schedule as my children, to I like kids, good start, um, to I when I was little, I always knew I wanted to do this because when I was little, I used to set up all my stuffed animals and I would tell them what to do. Or I'd bring my neighbor friends over and I'd give them homework. That's what they think teaching is. A lot of pre-service teachers think that's what it is. So to take somebody with that mindset, who sadly in universities is still sitting and listening, there's very little that deviates from that in universities. So, excuse me, it's reinforcing their preconception and then they get out and we could tell them anything about different strategies or anything else, and they get out and they're put into an environment where that still exists, it's pretty much ingrained in them. And that's a very tough thing to change. And an environment is not going to do that. Leadership will do that. Expectations will do that. And um, some enlightened training would do that. Yes.
I, I was going to. I was just going to comment that I think that that just as um, teachers and their qualifications and their desires have some independence from the environment. The environment has independent benefits for the learning environment. And I, I think that maybe speaks to some of the um, beautiful work that you showed us in your earlier presentations, is that there are schools like Crow Island that um, have a timelessness about them. It's not just that they were innovative at the time, but that you have fundamentally a great idea about a classroom that is square enough, that it's flexible, that it has a wet area, that it's flexible, that it has a garden, that, 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 that has these inventive qualities that are always going to be good, like good, really wonderful light and really wonderful space. And I think that those are the things that we can control, that, we can, that can always be our contribution to this discussion. Yeah, that I think is the story behind most of the schools that I think will be the award winners this year. I'm not giving anything away. No. <laughs> well, well, I think it's been very interesting, short but intense. <laughs> we should continue further. Actually. We will continue if I have it, if I have it my way, because um, one of the conclusions of this session is that we should here in Catalonia, the uh, Catalan Architects Association, we should start what I would like to call an observatory on educational architecture, something that doesn't exist yet. Uh, taking clues from your committee, how it is organized, and how your how your experiences have been, and so on. We have a residential observatory, we have a, a landscape observatory, but we don't have an educational observatory. And I think that will be that's something that we need. I don't know what you think, but I think we need it. We need to shake to shake the foundations of the establishment, which has been frozen for the last 25 years here. And we need to try to open perspectives on the people that are going to commission the schools, the people that are going to run the schools, the people that are going to use the schools. So that will be a first conclusion, which is probably <laughs> Um, something unexpected, but something that I actually mentioned to the dean before, and he totally is enthusiastic about this idea. So we, we will do something, and we, we count on you. We count on you in helping us out um, with this endeavor. And from the discussion, I, I gather that there are, <clears throat> I mean, from, from the different contributions, I gather that the corridor classroom model is something that already at the end of 19th century uh, it was tried to, to break, to, to open, to explode. Um, so I think all of the models we have, all, all the examples we have seen are based on another model which is uh, less hierarchical, less unidirectional space, more collaborative, more where serendipity happens. Uh, so this is, should be like the first layer on which to build our new projects. The second layer, I think, gathering from some of the, um, from the observations, I think that we should build that, of course, not with the standards from the 20s or the 30s, although they are excellent examples that are, they are still valid in many cases, and that's in itself a good lesson. And there is a story behind that it, with a thickness, uh, with a significant thickness that is important to have. But not with those standards, but with our standards. 
I am quite appalled to see, actually, I, I mentioned before, how many of the American examples are interiorized without no natural light. This cannot happen in Europe. And it is not only in educational um, buildings that it happens, this difference. Uh, another of our fields of expertise, which is uh, office buildings, I already noticed that office buildings in Europe have uh, narrower spans the ratio between height and depth is much more different than in America. In America, you can have buildings that are 20 or 25 meters deep, and nothing happens, or more. <laughs> Here, you have 8 plus 4 plus 8. That's the maximum, maximum. So, uh, well, this is... Uh, so, sustainability should start with that, I think. I mean, uh, or technology should be applied to get new standards, that's what I meant. Um, not the standards of the 10s or the 30s or the current standards, we're trying to see beyond that and try to incorporate new perspectives. And I think that uh, the, the third aspect, which I think it's important, coming from Barcelona, from our education as architects, from our experience as architects here, is that an, a contextual approach helps uh, giving identity to the building. The building is not an object that happens like a mushroom, and then it's lands nicely landscaped and so on, but it's something that happens in a in, an, in a context, that it, it is rooted in a context, it, and it is uh, using the context in its own benefit, and at the same time devolving that benefit to the community. So I think this, for me, would be like the three, at least for me, this is a very personal comment, <laughs> that like the three main lines on which to build a new educational space. And I want to thank you all for your uh, contributions for you being here and I hope you're enjoying the rest of your tour. Thank you.